Hello and welcome to The Sharpening Report. We have a very special episode for you today. For the first time ever, we have Tyler Gilreath, author of Gospel Over Gods, Jesus Christ, The Fallen Angels, and The Supernatural War of the Bible. If you're not familiar with his work yet, then you are in for a treat. Tyler is an avid Bible researcher, engaged writer, and dynamic speaker. He's earned degrees in both biblical studies and business, and he lives on the Gulf Coast with his loving wife and two children. Tyler Gilreath, welcome to the show, brother. How are you doing? Josh, I'm doing well, man. Uh, I've been looking forward to getting on here with you and talking with you. And I really, really appreciate everything you do. And, you know, the invitation to, to come and talk to your audience for a while just means the world to me. So I appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. Honor is all mine. And I really enjoyed your book. Um, and I, I really like the layout of it. Uh, for those who aren't yet familiar with you or your work, can you uh, get tell the audience some of your background, how you came to know Christ and how that uh, le- leads to what you do today? Absolutely. So I was blessed. You know, I had a great family growing up. I'm like a fourth or fifth generation preacher. So maybe it was kind of destined for me to always preach. But, you know, I, I had that desire you know, at a young age, you know, I wanted to share God's word. And so uh, my dad's a minister, my brother's a minister, you know, my, my granddad, great grandfather. And so, you know, I, I'm just like, my cup is like running over. I'm just so blessed, you know, to have such a great family. And so uh, I had a great background, you know, a great foundation in the Bible, but I wanted to, to really, you know, preach and, you know, be a, a proclaimer of God's word. So um, right out of high school, you know, I did a little bit, kind of messed around like a lot of people in college and decided to get serious. And so uh, I went to a, a small college in Memphis, Tennessee, a Bible college, and uh, studied the Bible there. Uh, really intense program. It was like, you know, a four year degree compiled into two years. And so, uh, you know, enjoyed my time out there uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And then, um, you know, God opened several opportunities opportunities for me to preach uh, over the years. And uh, now we're blessed to live here in uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, and uh, I'm a minister here uh, at a church. And so, uh, you know, it's just been a fun ride. And, you know, I'm, I'm appreciating more and more, you know, here I, here my Lord send me. And I'm just, I try to embody that attitude wherever God wants me to go, um, I will go. And so, you know, that's kind of a little bit about me. I have a beautiful wife. Her name is Nikki. And as you mentioned, I have two wonderful kids. And so I cannot be any more blessed by God. Uh, He has truly blessed me in so many ways. And so um, I appreciate you uh, talking about my book. So I do have a copy here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite lengthy. It's 508 pages. And so there's a lot in there. And so I'm looking forward to some of the questions that you're going to ask me today about yeah, you know the book and how I came to write the book. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, what I really appreciate uh, about the structure of the book, like, like you said, it is lengthy, but it's really easy to read. For each chapter, you have sections like uh, connecting the gospel, looking ahead, and and one that I'm going to be utilizing a lot, answering your questions. And you know that makes it really okay. easy. It makes it really easy to read, but uh, it's also really informative as well. Uh, so let's start with one of the first questions that you answer in the book about Genesis three fifteen. Take us back to the beginning in the Garden of of Eden. Uh, what did your research turn up about the fall, and what are the offsprings of both the woman and the serpent outlined in Genesis 3.15? You know, that's a great question, and, you know, I can't tell you how many times I read that passage, uh, even preached that passage, and very little thought was given into, you know, what is the serpent seed? You know, that, that famous Genesis 3.15 passage where, you know, as soon as uh, the Nahash, you know, deceived mankind, uh, God made a, a pretty bold proclamation. And that was, you know, look, there's going to be this confrontation. There's going to be this uh, this battle. And, and God was kind of predicting what was coming ahead. And that is, uh, you know, he would eventually have an offspring that would be the Savior. And we now know that's Jesus Christ, of course. You know, early on, that was uh, still very mysterious, uh, very hidden. And God would give us pieces of uh, who this uh, seed uh, was that would uh, be man's victor. But uh, for so long, it was kind of mysterious. And, uh, uh, you know, when I read that passage, I always just thought about Christ and what Christ would do. He would crush the head of the serpent. But I never really gave too much time or attention to 
uh, how the serpent would have a seed offspring. And so uh, several years ago, I had a good friend. In fact, it's in my introduction of the book. I had a good friend that challenged me on a lot of the spiritual things, spiritual warfare things that I talk about in my book. And so uh, I began a search. I began a journey. And uh, Genesis 3.15 was one of the first places uh, that I really had to stop and think about. And so the question was, you know, what's the serpent seed? Well, we see the serpent seed play out in many different ways. Sure, sometimes, you know, there's passages that kind of lend itself to the idea that, you know, Satan is the spiritual father of, of certain individuals. And anybody that follows in the path of the serpent cer- certainly, you know, sets themselves up for that. But there's something more at play in Genesis 3.15. And you, you really don't have to read very far in the biblical narrative before you're introduced to, you know, that idea of the serpent seed. And that is in Genesis chapter 6 in verses 1 through 4. And so, you know, in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, we're introduced to the idea of the B'nai Hat Elohim, the sons of God. Uh, of course, the uh, Septuagint or the LXX, you know, renders it the uh, Angelon Theu or the angels of God, you know, went into the daughters of men and produced the Nephilim. And the Nephilim were mighty men of old, the, the, you know, the, the men of great renown. And so uh, the serpent seed is, is uh, kind of twofold. It's, you know, the spiritual, uh, those who follow the Nahash, spiritually speaking, and then also those who, uh, you know, came from that forbidden union between um, angels and women. And, and you know, that, that plays out in the rest of the biblical narrative, and I'm sure we're going to get into that. You know, throughout the interview. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, we can uh, we can skip to that too because uh, you write about that right after um, uh, explaining Genesis three fifteen in, in your book. And and a lot of people watching the show are probably already familiar with the basic story of Genesis uh, six. But you you actually bring out some really interesting pieces of information about it that's uh, most likely not commonly known. What what can you tell us about the giants and the sons of God? What's come up in uh, your research? Well, you know, most people don't want to talk about it um, because it's something that's so foreign to them. But one thing I've come to learn and appreciate is that, you know, if we want to study the Bible, we have got to study it in its original context. And context is everything. You know, if, if you take the Bible out of context, you can make it say just about anything you want. Yeah. And so one thing that any, any Bible student has to do is they have to make the decision have to sacrifice their own beliefs, their own context, their own uh, belief system if they want to recover uh, the original message of Scripture. And so, you know, the original context, uh, you know, comes from that ancient understanding that there were some divine beings uh, whom rebelled, and they rebelled against Yahweh, the Elyon, you know, the God, the Most High God. And, uh, of course, you know, there's some Mesopotamian background in there, and I'm sure some of your audience is familiar with that, the uh, Apocalu, and, and uh, I don't really get too much into that in my book. I know some other authors, uh, Derek Gilbert uh, there at Skywatch, and, of course, uh, the, uh, the great Michael Heiser talks about that in his book, Reversing Hermon. But uh, in my book, I simply uh, I take some time to uh, listen to some ancient uh, people and uh, – you know, I, I quote a lot of church fathers, uh, historians, and, and whatnot. And one of the first, uh, you know, extra biblical, extra biblical, uh, biblical texts that I came across in my studies was uh, Josephus. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard Josephus quoted uh, from pulpits, from scholars, and whatnot, uh, because he, you know, he lived in a very ancient time, and he was very. Uh, particular about how he recorded knowledge. And uh, I was shocked when I first read Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews that he came out and said that those sons of God were the angels of God. And so you, you have, you know, very specific, you know, statements from very respected men such as Josephus and a lot of the early church fathers, you know, up until the time of uh, Augustine of Hippo, you know, fourth century uh, believed and taught that the sons of God, uh, sons of God, the B'nai Ha Elohim, are the angels of God. And so, you know, it, when did it go off the tracks? Well, it went off the tracks, you know, around the fourth century, 
when Augustine, in his writing The City of God, was so influential uh, that he ran all things supernatural out of the church. And so the reason that most Christians are unfamiliar with the ancient context of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is largely due to Augustine and his uh, influential writing. And so uh, I grew up in a, uh, you know, a faith that very much uh, believes in trying to restore the old paths. And uh, if we're serious about that, then we have got to, you know, recover the ancient context of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And so between the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which are, you know, invaluable, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls really revolutionize the way that we understand God and history and theology. And, uh, you know, sometimes we like to be hard on the guys that came before us and say, well, you know, I can't believe that they, they couldn't figure this out. Well, you know, we, we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And so when we discovered those scrolls, you know, it really was revolutionary. We, we were given insight into ancient texts that formerly uh, we were just unaware of. And so uh, it took a while for, you know, those Dead Sea Scrolls to, to, to come into a uh, – uh, a place where people could access them and study them. And so there is this tipping point, and I think we're seeing it now, where a lot of scholars uh, are being heavily influenced when they study those ancient documents uh, from Qumran. And so, uh, you know, to answer your question, the, uh, the Nephilim, uh, they are the offspring of uh, women and angels. And that was the understanding in the ancient world. And so, if we're serious about recovering those ancient contexts, then we will adopt and welcome those ancient understandings. Amen. You know, I'm really glad that you brought up the Dead Sea Scrolls because that that completely revolutionized even the way that I view um, – <clears throat> A lot of stuff in the Bible that, well, you brought up a really good example. A lot of times we as Christians are hard on the ancient people. Like, how did they not see Jesus coming? Like, how did they not see it? Well, it turns out when we read through the Dead Sea Scrolls, it turns out there actually was a faction of uh, Jewish people that were expecting um, Jesus, that were expecting uh, the Messiah to be God incarnate. And uh, like 11Q Melchizedek is one of the most amazing documents I've ever read in terms of uh, the identity of the Messiah, you know, written a couple hundred years before Jesus was born. So, I mean, they, they, some of them actually did see it coming, but some of them uh, chose not to see it coming because, as you said, we have the offspring, the, the kind of spiritual offspring of the serpent, the, the followers of, of uh, Satan and the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's, it's an amazing story. And speaking of the Dead yeah. Sea Scrolls, uh, one of them that most people are have at least heard of uh, is the Book of Enoch. And w- what does the Book of Enoch have to add? And sh- should we even take it seriously? Was it written by by Enoch himself? You know, that, that's a great question, and that's really what most people want to know. Um, now, before I answer this question, I would encourage you to study the book of Enoch simply because the, uh, you know, the ancient Jews and early Christians studied the material. And so sometimes we fall into this trap where, you know, if it's not in the 66 books of the Bible, it's not important or, uh, you know, it has no value, and, and that's just not true. Um, there were a lot of books that were studied uh, and were given a lot of respect um, in the Second Temple period uh, and also in the, uh, the early church. Um, and, you know, we have the 66 books in our Bible, but understand that there are other canons out there uh, that you know, people follow. And, you know, the book of Enoch is a, uh, it's a book that is canonized in the Ethiopian Bible. Uh, that's the only, you know, really... Uh, I guess, Christian faith group that, you know, considers the book of Enoch canonical. Uh, But it would be very foreign to, you know, the second temple Jews and also the first century, second century, third century Christians. If we say, don't study that material, they would think you're crazy. Right. You know, what do you mean? I mean, it's like, it's it's like sitting on the shelf of every, uh, you know, bookshelf in every home. I mean, it was, it was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. People were studying it. They were talking about it. And it really framed their worldview. Um, and so the question came, you know, is Enoch, you know, written by Enoch? And the reason why it was so highly debated, especially uh, in the first century, is because, you know, Jude's use of it. Uh, Jude quotes from the book of Enoch uh, on several places in Jude's small treatise there. And so uh, that really gave it a lot of credibility. Uh, that a lot of people uh, really didn't like. It made them uncomfortable. 
In fact, so much so that the book of Jude almost didn't make it in the canon mm-hmm. because of its use of the book of Enoch. And so, uh, you know, that's, that, that's the question, though. Did Enoch write uh, the book of Enoch? And perhaps uh, we will never fully know, did he write the entire book or not? I, I certainly believe that there are parts of it uh, that obviously he did write. Uh, and, you know, Jude talks about those things. And so uh, I believe, you know, the, the Watcher's narrative uh, of the, the 200 Watchers that descended on Mount Hermon, uh, I look at that as uh, historical, a historical event. Uh, that is true. Uh, I don't see any reason to uh, doubt that event uh, because in my book and other books uh, by other authors, you know, it's pointed out that Jesus does very specific things uh, that relate back to that uh, narrative of the fallen angels who descended on Mount Hermon and made the pact to corrupt humanity. Uh, In fact, uh, as you know, Josh, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration uh, was you know, Mount Hermon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For years, they thought, you know, it was, it was, uh, you know, other sites or other mountains, but, uh, you know, it, it was simply not. And I go with, into that in my book, and I would encourage other people to research this, but the very mountain that Jesus descended to reveal himself to uh, all of the world or to all of the powers of darkness was the very mountain uh, of corruption. Uh, it was that very mountain of Bashan, uh, that you read about a lot of times in the Old Testament, that was a very sinister place, and uh, it didn't lose, uh, you know, its uh, sinister motif in the New Testament uh, because uh, it was a, a place uh, of great corruption. It was a place of uh, of idol worship. It was a place of uh, veneration to the gods, and so uh, Jesus chose that site uh, to reveal Himself uh, to the powers of darkness to show Him that who He was. And why he was here. And he told his disciples, you know, hey, uh, see this this rock? I'm going to build my church upon this rock, uh, this rock of rebellion. And the gates of uh, hell shall not prevail against it or shall not withstand it. And uh, so uh, I believe, I look at the book of Enoch as, uh, you know, since I grew up not believing it to be canonical, I, I don't necessarily read it in the canonical light, but I do read it in a light that, uh, really framed the worldview of, you know, the apostles, of Jesus, of, uh, you know, Second Temple Jews. And so, um, you know, the reason why the book of Enoch is not considered canonical is simply because, um, you know, we, we don't have great documentation prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls. If I'm not mistaken, what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was Aramaic, I believe. Uh, Enoch was written in Aramaic, and we don't have any Hebrew, uh, you know, Paleo Hebrew, you know, certainly to, to to say that this material is much older. But you know, there is a uh, a precedent set by the uh, you know the Essenes at Qumran, and they certainly believe that Enoch was inspired of God. I mean, they certainly believe that it was you know just as important to preserve as all the other books uh, that they esteem very highly, and so. You know, it just depends on what group you, you're talking to. You know, some groups, uh, you know, simply reject it, say don't read it. You know, some groups embrace it and say this is inspired of God. But I would encourage you to do your own homework if you're watching this uh, interview because uh, the book of Enoch has a lot of great insight. And as I, you know, showed and laid out in my book, there are a lot of literary touch points in the New Testament that relate directly to the book of Enoch. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with all of that. That I think, and I think that's a, a really good way of looking at it because some, like you said, some people go too far and they say, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't even read it. Some people go too far in the other direction and say, no, we absolutely have to put it in the Bible. It's the sixty seventh book of the Bible, and I, I don't agree with that either. Uh, but you know, like like you said, yeah. it, you know, read it as as history and as a document that uh, framed the worldview of of the ancients of the time. I, I think that's a great way to uh, view it. Speaking of worldviews, um, there's there's actually something really interesting in the Tower of Babel incident. And when I first heard this uh, from my good friend Dr. Michael Heiser that you mentioned earlier, this was this was another other game changer for me. Uh, but you even bring out some ancient church fathers who talk about this. Can you explain uh, the angelic allotment from Deuteronomy thir- 32 and then what that has to do with the Tower of Babel? Absolutely. And so, you know, there are three divine rebellions, and one of them is very familiar to most Christians, and that is, you know, the fall in Eden. 
But what's unfamiliar is the other two, and we already talked about Genesis 6. And so the third is, you know, the Tower of Babel. And so Babel has always been uh, a a place in in the Bible that has really troubled people for a long time, and and it is quite confusing. And so, you know, for years, you know, most of our Bibles are based upon the Masoretic text. And so it's just a form of Hebrew, you know, documents that are not as old as the Dead Sea Scrolls, but that's all we had for a long time. and so for generations, you know, we were reading in our you know, English Bibles that when God divided the nations, he divided them according to the number of the sons of Israel. And so, you know, it's like nothing to see here. Move along, Bible student. You know, let's, just, let's keep moving on. This is unimportant. Um, but that really should have, uh, you know, been a red flag to a lot of people because, you know, Israel was not even a nation. You know, at the Tower of Babel, you can't divide something according to something that doesn't exist. And so, you know, it, that was very odd. But, you know, for a long time, we didn't really question that. And so uh, you had you had that. And then, of course, when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 47, the Dead Sea Scrolls said something very different than the Masoretic text. Um, it said that when God divided the nations, he divided it according to the number of the B'nai Ha Elohim, the same structure, the same Hebrew construct that occurs six times in the Hebrew Bible. And I've always said it's best to let the Bible define its own terms. And so let's just say uh, you're not sure what Genesis 6 means. Let's just say you're not sure what Deuteronomy 32 means. If you want to find out who, just who the B'nai Ha Elohim are, then you have to look no further than the book of Job. The book of Job lays out three times in Job chapter 1, in Job chapter 2 and Job chapter 38, you know, in Job 38, it's one of the great classic um, definitions of who the sons of God are. It talks about when God laid the foundations of the earth, the sons of God shouted for joy. They sang. Well, that rules out, you know, humans because humans were not in existence when God laid the foundation of the earth. And so, um, you know, to answer your question, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 47. The Dead Sea Scrolls said, God divided the nations according to the number of the B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of God. Okay. Now, one thing that is really fascinating is uh, if you're watching this, I would encourage you to look at uh, these passages side by side with the LXX or uh, the Septuagint. Okay. You know, I think the Lexham English Septuagint is, is probably free online uh, to look at, but. Um, there's some other ones, Britain, you know, LXX and whatnot. But when you compare Deuteronomy 32, uh, in fact, when you look at all these passages, uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, Job 38, and Deuteronomy 32, on all of these, it says every time the Masoretic, or, or excuse me, every time the Dead Sea Scroll says, B'nai Ha Elohim, uh, the Septuagint says, angels of God. And so you got three different renderings. For a long time, we read Sons of Israel, and we were ignoring this thing called the Septuagint, which we thought was not important. But when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we say, oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, it actually lines up with the Septuagint, and it's consistent with the Septuagint. And so that's what happened at Babel. You know, God divorced the nations. Uh, He allotted the nations to angelic beings. And he gave these nations languages. He set the bounds of the people and he gave them uh, certain Elohim to follow. OK, uh, these Elohim or spiritual beings were, uh, I believe, once loyal to Yahweh, the God of the Bible. But as Psalm 82 reveals, uh, these Elohim rebelled against God. And they led man astray. And that is the biblical and ancient understanding of why there are other Elohim or other small g gods in the Bible. You know, I think most Christians grow up thinking, man, these nations are crazy. Why in the world are they worshiping things that don't exist? And I certainly did. And I certainly thought it was even stranger that, you know, God's covenant people, Israel, who knew God's power, who saw God's power on you know, Mount Sinai when he delivered the law, those same people left Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and served other Elohim, other gods. And it was so strange to me. Why in the world would they leave somebody they knew that existed that was powerful and worship a being or worship other beings that don't exist? 
Well, it turns out, yeah, they kind of do exist. And, you know, these are, you know, powerful beings that uh, fell from heaven. They fell from God's good standing, and they align themselves with the serpent of Genesis chapter 3. And so, you know, that's, that's the ancient understanding of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview and the allotment of God's worldview. And I'll tell you what's tell, uh, really telling, and I, I, I talk about this in my book, but the Hebrews were not the only people telling the story of the angelic allotment. Uh, when you go back and you read guys like Plato, you know, who lived hundreds of years before Christ, you know, they're very specific and they say, you know, the reason why the nations have gods is because they were allotted gods. You know, they were allotted gods. And so the Gentiles had the same cosmology, the same worldview as the Hebrews, and that is an allotment of God's worldview. We're not saying that Yahweh is going to be threatened in some way by these other Elohim, but he allows these other Elohim to function and to operate, and he, you know, just, just like he allows us to have free will, he allows his angelic sons of God to also have free will. Just turns out these Elohim rebelled. Yeah, definitely. That and that whole account is so uh, fascinating, and, and it explains so much in our world. How did all these other religions get started? Why are there so many commonalities in uh, yeah. these ancient histories, like you brought up too? Before we uh, head to break, Tyler, if people want to get your book or find out more about you, where can they do that? Where can they follow you online? Um, so if, it's certainly on Amazon. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on uh, Books a Million. Um, you can buy it. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, Barnes and Noble as well now, and so it's on several different uh, places where you know all good books are sold. Uh, I also have a website you can check out at gospelovergods.com, and so uh, any of those uh, places you can check out my material and uh, you know get you a, a copy of my book. So. Excellent. I highly suggest everybody do that. We have a, a lot more to talk about, but we're going to do that in the members only section right after this. Dr. Ken Johnson and I, if uh, if those of you out there are familiar with Dr. Ken Johnson, he's been a guest on before. We're going to have him back on again to talk about this calendar. But um, he has a website called dsscalendar.org, and it's basically an online version of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, which is a great resource. It's for free. Anybody can use it, but it does also mean that you have have to, it's not an app, it's a website, so you have to pull out your phone every time you want to look at it and, and scroll around and look for things. So I reached out to Ken and I said, hey, what would you think about us uh, kind of like going into business together, but what, what would you say about producing a print calendar? Because I, I know how to do that. He already designed the calendar, so the hard work's done. I know how to get it into print and get it out to people. What, what do you say? And he was all for it. He was excited about it. So Ken and I worked together and produced the Ancient Dead See scroll calendar in print form and this is for this year uh, and it, it's it's absolutely beautifully uh, printed. There are eight different styles, eight different uh, versions of this calendar that people can get if they want to but basically what you have is I don't know if people can see that but you have the Dead Sea Scroll uh, calendar on the top with all the feast days and everything and then on the bottom you have the normal just American regular kind of calendar even uh, even if you if you get the square one the square style you even get like pictures for St. Patrick's Day and the holidays and stuff like that uh, so that is for this year it starts in March so don't think well it's four months into the year by now there's no point in getting one the Dead Sea Scroll calendar starts in March so it's a great time to pick one up but as I said we also have uh, several other options. We have three different poster versions, which are just, you know, they're just posters. Uh, we have three different versions of that. We have um, a desk calendar style. Uh, so, you know, th this is like if you if you have a family member or a friend or something that has a desk job or something, this is, this is a great gift. Uh, and then we also have this little CD case version, which is, I thought this was a uh, pretty innovative and cool, but it just opens like a CD, but you can stand it on your desk like that. And then it's, uh, you just have cards. They, they come out as cards. There's, uh, the calendar on one side and then there's, uh, the American holidays on the, on the back side. 
and you just set it on your on your desk or wherever like that. So if people want that, there is a link in the description below. And by the time this episode airs, we should have uh, the link right at dailyrenegade.com. So if you go to dailyrenegade.com right now, you should, if I'm timing this out right, you should see a graphic right on the page on the login screen. You don't have to be a member to take advantage of this, but uh, it'll, uh, we'll put it right on the login screen. DailyRenegade.com. You'll see a graphic there. You can click on that, pick your calendar, and uh, we'll we'll keep doing this every year. Or you can go to Dr. Ken Johnson's website, BibleFacts.org or DSScalendar.org, and you can see the same graphic there and get it there. Either way, it takes you to the same place, and uh, your purchase of a calendar goes both to help support Ken's ministry and Daily Renegade. So uh, if you already know that you love us both and you want a calendar, that's the place to go. Uh, Okay, so we are going to take a break and we're going to pick this back up in the members only section. If you haven't had a chance yet, again, please go to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership today. If you get a monthly or yearly membership, you'll have full access uh, to my newest film dealing with how Christians should look at the UFO disclosure movement that's been opening up more and more in our government today. It seems like every day now we're getting new uh, news headlines on how the government is admitting to more and more and more. Well, how are we as Christians to respond to that? And what is this connection between UFO disclosure events and major events in Israel's uh, history and geopolitics in the Middle East? Because things are heating up there too. And these two seemingly different things uh, converge somehow. So the film gets into all that. Um, and it, it, I'm in it. Derek Gilbert is in it. Uh, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, uh, Steve Ciccolani, uh, Pastor Steve, if you guys uh, know him from, from YouTube and other various places. My wife, Christina, is in it. So it's a great lineup. It's also narrated by Zachary Lautitas. If you're familiar with that show, Prison Break, he was in that. He's been in a couple other movies and stuff since then. But he actually got me and Derek's book, The Day the Earth Stands Still, which is what this film is based on. Uh, He got a hold of that about a year ago, and uh, it it really inspired him to reach out to me and Derek and then do some research uh, on his own. So we're going to be having him on the show sometime soon because he's got some amazing insights uh, especially just being connected with Hollywood and seeing what's going on there. This is a truly historic moment. It will be known as the Abraham Accord. Ever since the news broke of the peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, many Christians have been wondering what it all means. Is it significant? Is it momentous and historic? Or could it even be prophetic? Most importantly, after this, what comes next? Everybody said this would be impossible. That film, What Comes Next, it is only available for paying members, but if you want a free trial, there are still some free things for you. Uh, Most specifically, we have a free episode of The Sharpening Report right now with financial expert and Christian Terry Saka right on the front page of dailyrenegade.com, which explains the financial crisis that we're in now and how we as Christians can safely protect our assets with an actual Christian company. This company is amazing. It's basically a ministry effort for us Christians, and it's done through precious metals. So you can go there uh, or just go to Cornerstone Assets in the link in the description below and request more uh, information. I have some silver myself, and I believe that every Christian should absolutely be doing this instead of trusting satanic organizations and doomed-to-fail currency options such as fiat and the banks and all all of that with with your resources uh, and what you leave behind for your family. At least with Cornerstone, you're um, working with Christians. You, you You have to protect yourself, your family, your assets, and Cornerstone is the only Christian company that I trust with something so important and vital. So check it out. Uh, More information at dailyrenegade.com. Go ahead and watch that episode of The Sharpening Report. It's free for everybody and get the information. If you haven't had a chance yet, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership today where we will continue our conversation with Tyler Gilreath. Members, hang on the line. Everyone else, take care and God bless.